Hey, have you ever received an invitation to an event that you weren't sort of expecting uh, to get? Uh, I remember a few years back, uh, this photo popped up on my uh, Instagram uh, feed. It was a friend of uh, mine uh, who got to meet with the Pope. And I remember seeing this photo and just thinking, how on earth has this friend of mine, uh, who was a refugee from Sudan, ended up being part of a discussion group with the Pope? Well, it turns out that her wedding vi- uh, video went viral uh, and kicked off a YouTube channel that earned some incredible amount of money, 200000 a year or something. Uh, and, and so because of that, YouTube had chosen her uh, and her uh, husband uh, as under-21 uh, influencers, uh, and they'd invited them to come and have this meeting with the Pope to talk about social media and the world and various issues. And uh, I was like, man, who would have seen that coming when she was a refugee flying out of Sudan trying to escape a war-torn country, coming to Australia with nothing, that she would get an invitation to meet with the Pope. It's kind of like crazy. Uh, I've certainly never had anything uh, quite like that, but who knows, you know, maybe Pack 5 one day. Uh, we're a few million subscribers short, a couple hundred thousand dollars a year, but who knows, Right. I did, though, I did, though, once have the privilege of going to a wedding uh, of a Brisbane Lions footballer uh, one time, and I remember being at that wedding and just kind of looking around, and there's all these Brisbane Lions football players everywhere, and maybe that means absolutely nothing to you, but I remember just standing there going, like, these guys are all, like, I know every single person in the room, and they have absolutely no idea who I am, but I know all of them by name, and we're on the dance floor, I'm like, hey, Hugh, like, hey, Harris, and they're like, who is this guy? I remember that. I remember thinking when the invitation came in the mail for me to come, I remember thinking, man, wow. Like I I couldn't believe that I'd been chosen to be part of this kind of wedding uh, gathering. I wonder if my friend uh, Nikki thought the same thing when that invitation came to come and meet with the Pope. I wonder if she thought, man, I can't believe that I've been chosen to be part of this kind of gathering. I don't know, have you, uh, if you've received an invitation to something like that, something that blew you uh, away, I don't know if you've uh, received an invitation like that, but I want to tell you, actually, you have. Maybe you don't realize it uh, just yet, but you've actually received an incredible uh, invitation. Blows my wedding invitation and an invitation to be with the Pope out of the water And I'm hoping tonight as we have a look at this uh, Exodus 19 chapter, I'm hopeful that you're going to see why that is the case. And I want to start by having a look at the invitation that's actually right here in Exodus chapter 19. An incredible, a ridiculous invitation, in fact, that is made. So keep your Bibles open uh, or turn them back on or open them back up uh, to Exodus uh, chapter 19. Because what God says to the people here is actually an invitation that is off the charts. If you have a look at those opening uh, three verses of chapter 19, you'll see that the Israelites, they've journeyed now to the mountain and they've made camp here at the foot of this mountain. And then Moses goes up the mountain to kind of meet with God. God has a message. He wants his main man, Moses, to pass on to these people. Have a look at verse 4. This is the message that God has. He says, You yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt and how I carried you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. God's saying, Hey guys, remember how I put this massive beat down on Egypt? I freed you from that slavery and from that oppression. He uses this beautiful phrase here, how I carried you on eagles' wings. It's a, it's a beautiful picture that's demonstrating this is all God's work, carried the people on eagles' wings. See, they can't fly, so to speak, so God flies for them. It's a reminder that they can trust God. They have nothing to fear. He's got their back. When they couldn't fly, he flew for them. When they're trapped in slavery, he brought them out. And he's saying, hey, remember how I did that for you. But God's love doesn't stop there at just bringing them out. Have a look at verses 5 and 6. He says, Now if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all the nations you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words you are to speak to the Israelites. What an incredible invitation 
God is making there. Out of all the nations, out of all the people, groups on earth, you, Israel, I've chosen you. I'm inviting you to be my treasured possession. The creator of the whole universe, the one to whom everything belongs, is putting down an invitation for these people to be what is most treasured to him. Man, talk about an invitation, right? Dear Mr. and Mrs. Israel, you've been invited to be part of the kingdom of God. You don't need to bring a gift. I just want you. And in return, I ask that you trust me and follow what I say. See, obedience there, as uh, is God talks about, it's simply the act of trust that the one who made the invitation in the first place wants what's best for them. It doesn't get more incredible than that, really, does it? And then they respond exactly how you'd expect a group of people receiving an incredible invitation to respond. Have a look at uh, verse 7 of chapter 19. It's because Moses, he goes back to the people and he summons the elders. And then the people all respond together in verse 8. We will do everything the Lord has said. And Moses brings that answer to the Lord. We'll do everything you say, God. After that invitation, they're like a a starry-eyed girl looking down at the man proposing a thousand times, yes, we'll trust you, God. We'll do everything you say a thousand times, yes. What an invitation. You know that uh, scene in the movie? Maybe you've even seen it play out in uh, real life, but that school bully or that class rat bag is getting called out for doing the wrong thing and they stand there and they're like, yes, miss, I will definitely improve my behavior. I'll change what I do. And you're sitting there and you kind of know that is the most bogus response ever. They haven't changed. You know nothing different is going to happen. They're just saying that in the moment. Well, I actually reckon that's not too dissimilar to what's going on right here for the Israelites before God. See, in another book in the Bible, a book called Ezekiel, it comes a a little bit later on in the life of these uh, Israelite people. We get a bit of a fresh insight looking back at this Exodus moment. In Ezekiel, God is speaking to people many years later, and he's reminding them of what's happened here in the book of Exodus. And in Ezekiel, we actually learned that back in Egypt, the Israelites had adopted all these idols. They'd taken on all these idols from Egypt. And God had asked them, hey, get rid of those idols. I want you to get rid of those idols. But we read in Ezekiel that they don't. God says they rebel and they keep their idols. And it's pretty safe to assume that right now here at the mountain, with no evidence to the contrary, and what goes on in Ezekiel, that they still have those idols with them. And in fact, in a few more chapters' time, we're going to see they're going to make a whole new idol to worship. Here they are saying, yes, Lord, a thousand times, yes, we'll follow you. What a load of rubbish. That haven't changed. The starry-eyed girlfriend saying a thousand times, yes, is more like a girl with her other boyfriend waiting in the car at home for when she arrives. That's more like what's going on here. And God knows that. He knows they're never going to keep up their end of the bargain to obey him fully. Not even for one minute because the idols, they already still have them. But here's the thing. It changes nothing for God. Even though he knows they're never going to do what they promise. He chooses to love them anyway. He chooses to rescue them. And then make this incredible invitation, even while they hold on to idols that make a mockery of him. Now, I don't want you to miss how incredible this is. Because what comes next in the story of Exodus is that God comes down. We saw that in the Ron video. And there's thunder and there's lightning and there's the sound of trumpets. It's an incredible moment where the difference between a perfect God and sinful people is on display. If they get too close, they're going to be eliminated. That's the difference that exists between them and God. And as God comes down 
begins to unpack what obeying him looks like. If you go on to chapter 20, you'll see, even if you look in your Bibles there, it's the moment we're introduced to the Ten Commandments. Now, I don't know what you think when you hear the word uh, Ten Commandments. Maybe it creates images in your mind of a really long-bearded guy carrying stone uh, tablets. Or maybe it's the kind of moment that you've sort of been waiting for at youth, just to confirm your idea of who God is, because the idea of a God with Ten Commandments kind of fits your picture of an angry God who takes away freedom and makes a heap of rules. I don't know. I don't know what the idea of Ten Commandments Strikes for you, but I want you to press in to just how incredible the invitation is that God has made just before chapter 20, here in chapter 19. Before giving them rules to live by. And even when they've chosen already to reject his lordship and rule, by not getting rid of the false gods that they worship, it's then, in that moment, that God makes this incredible invitation to them. See how important it is to know that? See, the God of the Bible, he's not an angry God. Far from it. He's not an angry, freedom-restricting God who's just about rules and punishment. This is a God who is filled with mercy and grace, incredible love, who fights for his people, makes a commitment to his people long before they ever make a commitment to him. And the reason why I want you to notice that here in Exodus 19 is because it's the very same thing that we see in Jesus. When Jesus gave up his life to pay the penalty of sin, so he knew the hearts of people that he was dying for were no different to the hearts of the Israelites here in Exodus 19. We've looked at it a few times in this series, but as Romans reminds us, God demonstrates his own love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. See, long before anyone made a commitment to follow God, God made a commitment to them. That's how it's always been with God. His invitation has always come to people miles away from being able to uphold any deal or any agreement. God's invitation always comes before the instructions for living. That way people can follow him, submit themselves to his rule, not to gain his love, but to show respect for it. There's nothing more incredible than God's love for his people. Despite their sin and their rejection of him, he invites them into his kingdom anyway. And if you're here tonight and you're wondering about the God of the Bible, then I want you to know that's how much God loves you. Maybe you don't realize it yet, but you've received an invitation that you don't deserve. An offer to be part of God's kingdom, be treasured by him more than you could ever imagine. And all you have to do is come to Jesus and take his invitation. That's it. He's already done everything you need to get there. You can't get there on your own. No matter how hard you try, you can't be good enough. You can't do enough. You can't get what's done to make it. You just need to let him carry you on his wings. Because there is nothing more incredible than God's love for you. Despite your sin. And your rejection of him, he invites you into his kingdom anyway. I want to say, if you're checking out God, you're checking out Christianity and you don't know that invitation, then it's there for you. Tonight, come to Jesus. Or maybe tonight you know you've been invited. You've been invited to be part of God's kingdom. But there are things holding you back from committing to following Jesus. Maybe you're afraid of what you have to give up or what you might have to give up. Maybe your popularity, what people might think of you. Maybe you feel like you might have to give up activities that you love in order to prioritize Jesus. Maybe you've done something that you're ashamed of. 
And you think that it stops you from being able to accept that invitation, to be accepted by God. That maybe this invitation isn't really for you. Well, tonight my prayer is that you might see just how incredible God's love for you is. Specifically for you. Not generally for people, but how incredible God's love for you is. That Jesus gave up his life for, insert your name here, gave up his life for you. Yeah, for you. Whatever it is that's holding you back, it doesn't need to. I want to say to you tonight, let it go and take hold of that invitation that God has made to you. But I wonder whether maybe for a bunch of us, maybe a bunch of us here tonight, it's easy to let youth kind of become a bit like that mountaintop experience for the Israelites. Here on Friday nights, maybe even Sunday mornings, we're just like those Israelites. I'll always follow you, Jesus. I'll always trust you. But home in our tents are the idols of our lives that we refuse to get rid of. Happy to promise the world to Jesus on a Friday night, but not willing to give up fitting in on a Monday. I'll do anything for you, Jesus, on Sunday morning, but not able to find time to spend with him on Monday to Saturday. I'll follow all your commands, Jesus, on Friday nights and Sunday mornings, but not willing to end that secret relationship that you have. It causes you to cross boundaries you know you shouldn't. It's easy to do, right? Have that moment where we come and commit everything to Jesus, but at home there are things that we just will not let go of. If that's you tonight, and let's be real, that's all of us who follow Jesus at various points, then I want you to see the character of the God here in Exodus. Because maybe tonight you know that's you. And you feel the guilt and the shame. Maybe you even feel like you're a fake Christian. Who I am here at the hall isn't who I am when I'm outside it. If that's you tonight, then I want you to know that living like that is wrong. And it's good to feel guilty for it. But I want you to remember the character of the God who rescued you from slavery to sin. See, your hope isn't turning your double life around. Your hope isn't in improving your behavior. It's in God who has given you a ridiculously undeserved invitation. Your hope lies in, for change in a God who carries you on eagles' wings, out of darkness and into light. In Jesus who lived that perfect life that you could never live and then died in your place. Brother, sister, strive to get rid of that sin in your life. Strive to give up the, your idols. Not because it will make you a better Christian or a Christian or give you a relationship with God but because it honors the relationship God has already given you. See, our God is incredible, and his love for you is incredible, and there is none like him. Hey, let's pray. Father God, your love for us in Jesus is incredible. There is... Nothing like it. That you would invite sinful, broken people like us who reject you, who don't want to have anything to do with you, who choose other things over you, and yet you love us anyway and make an invitation for us to be part of your kingdom despite our rejection of you. There is nothing like your love, Lord. Help us to see that. Help us to know that. For those here tonight who are yet to discover that incredible truth, would you help them to see how much you love them? For those here tonight who feel like they are living that double life, one thing here at the hall, another thing at home, help them to see that their hope lies not in turning that around, but in coming to you and your love for them. Father God, may knowing your love change each one of us tonight, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.
Yo, that was the best episode yet. Oh, let's try that again. Hey, I hope you liked that video. Uh, like and subscribe. Uh, check out some other <laughs> content uh, that we've got there. Let others know about the Pack 5 movement. Awesome. But from us, for now, peace out.